I'll uh, start uh, with a, a brief introduction to, uh, to graphene. And many of you may have uh, seen the introduction before, but uh, you know, repetition is the mother of all learning. The Simple Show explains graphene. This is graphene. Let's call him Mr. G. He is the first material that is two-dimensional. This gives him a unique set of properties. Since 1859, many scientists were looking for graphene using complex experiments. But the first crystals of graphene were discovered in 2004 using a very simple and effective method, namely ordinary scotch tape. During Friday evening experiments in Manchester, scientists noticed small parts of graphene on the tape used to clean a graphite stone. The two scientists, Andrew Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, were awarded with the Nobel Prize in Physics 2010 for this simple but groundbreaking experiment. Thanks to the scotch tape method, this area of science grew extremely quickly. And today, hundreds of laboratories all over the world deal with different aspects of G research. What makes Mr. G a really super material? is the combination of his unique properties. G is the first 2D crystal ever known to us, the thinnest object ever obtained, and also the lightest one. G is the world's strongest material, harder than diamond and about 300 times stronger than steel. G conducts electricity much better than copper. G is a transparent material G is bendable and can take any form you want. And this unique super material gave birth to a new class of crystals that are also just one atom thin. And what's more fantastic is that these can be shuffled with each other to engineer new materials on demand to meet the special needs of different industries. All these factors move graphene swiftly from the G Research Laboratory to the G Marketplace, driven by demand from industries where such supermaterials are required. Aerospace, automotive, electronics, energy storage, coatings and paints, communications, sensor, solar, oil, and etc. Thanks to mass production methods intensively being developed, Expect to meet Mr. G in person soon. All right, so that was the uh, brief introduction, and uh, you can find that both on our web page and on YouTube. And it, uh, we've used it a number of times over the years. Uh, uh, it's been usually quite appreciated. Uh, already that video indicated uh, one of the key features of uh, graphene which is that it's a very versatile, it's a, a multipotent, potent, if not quite omnipotent material. Uh, you can use it uh, for information and communication technology, for instance in uh, this kind of a uh, window uh, that can be made transparent or not uh, electrically and it can bend. Uh, optoelectronical applications in materials, uh, science or materials research, it uh, gives the possibility for ultralight uh, strong composite materials due to the fact that graphene is between 100 and 300 times stronger than, uh, than steel per uh, unit weight, uh, which is of great interest for aerospace and, uh, and uh, automobile industries. Uh, conductive inks is an, uh, another type of material where uh, graphene can make an impact. Uh, energy applications uh, graphene uh, has extremely good electrical conductivity and large surface area, which are the key requirements uh, for electrodes in advanced batteries and supercapacitors. These are being developed uh, uh, not only for cars, but also for portable electronics. Uh, more and more of electronics is portable, so the importance of battery technologies is uh, rapidly increasing. Uh, in the uh, uh, health sciences, uh, you can use uh, graphene, for instance, in, uh, as is indicated here. There's a small hole in graphene. You pull a DNA through the hole, and depending on which base pair is in the hole, the conductivity changes, and you can read off uh, the base pairs. At, at this time, as far as I know, you don't have a single base pair resolution, but you can 
uh, you can get towards that by making the hole smaller. And there's, uh, for instance, in, uh, at Harvard, there's a huge uh, NIH program uh, looking into these things. Uh, this is from Kess Decker's group in Delft, uh, who's the leading European partner in that. Uh, all in all, many kinds of biosensors and sensors in general are interesting uh, because, as far as I know, most sensors work so that you have a material and you disturb something on the surface. You put some molecule or some uh, small mass particle on the surface. And in most materials, the surface is only a vanishingly small part of the uh, material itself. Most is bulk. In graphene, there is no bulk. So any disturbance on the surface is going to result in a, a big uh, response in the material itself. The top is a term that we have uh, borrowed from uh, uh, friends and colleagues in the uh, biosciences and medicine. We describe graphene as translational nanotechnology. Uh, that is nanotechnology that can rapidly move uh, from academic laboratories uh, to the marketplace in different areas. And I think this uh, two aspects that it is uh, a fast mover and it's very versatile were the key uh, uh, reasons that we uh, that led to the flagship. And during the uh, flagship uh, uh, work, we uh, prepared a uh, first version of a scientific and technological roadmap, which is a, uh, already the first version is a formidable document. Uh, there's a lot of information here. I don't expect that you will absorb all this information. A uh, couple of things you should notice. Uh, first thing to notice is that it looks more blue on the left. The blue uh, are people like me, academics. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side, it looks more red. Uh, that's most of you. Uh, that's industrial. Uh, so that's the first thing to, uh, to uh, see. The other thing to see is that uh, it's been divided into uh, three segments. One on uh, materials or production technolo technologies, the other one on components, and uh, the last one on system integration. All these three parts must be covered if we are to create a, a new technology. And they need to be covered roughly in this direction. First, you need to uh, make sure that the right kind of a material is available uh, for the right price, right quantity, uh, right quality. Uh, then you need to convince uh, component manufacturers to use this material to make something out of it. And finally, you need to take the components into systems and combine them in such ways that you can sell them. Uh, and uh, in Europe, we don't really have any single company that by itself would cover this entire spectrum, which means that we need to work together. We have a lot of very successful chemical companies here. We have a lot of uh, successful systems integrators there. We are perhaps not as strong in the uh, middle part. Uh, if you compare that situation to uh, uh, our competitors in the Far East, for instance, you find companies that within the same company do the entire integration. And that uh, makes it much easier for them to make the decision that, okay, we are going to invest in this uh, technology. We need to work together. This uh, scientific and technological roadmap can, also, or of course, be uh, uh, narrowed down to specific uh, technical requirements. If you want to create graphene-based fiber optical communication systems, we need to have uh, structures that have ultra-fast optical response and uh, uh, sufficient optical modulation. This is not the time and the place to uh, go uh, and look into each bubble in, in great detail. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, this is the first version of the scientific and technological roadmap. The second version is being finished now. And last time I saw it was about 300 pages and about 1,500 references. So it's a significant piece of work, uh, covering things that are uh, above and beyond what the flagship does. It's a worldwide uh, analysis. The flagship will do uh, some aspects. For instance, we have chosen not to uh, uh, focus on things like uh, display technologies because their LG and Samsung are investing so much money and uh, that uh, it would be uh, foolish of us trying to uh, uh, compete with them there. Uh, graphene production. Uh, that tends to be uh, one of the first questions from an audience like this. Uh, there are many different ways of making graphene. Uh, there is the way that you use if you want to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, which is uh, very good for research. It still gives uh, the best quality graphene of any method. Uh, and it's something uh, that you can do yourself. You probably have done it yourself. It's uh, not very difficult. You uh, have a piece of graphite and a tape, and you uh, keep folding the tape back and forth, and eventually you will only get a monolayer. 
The hard part is to know when you have gotten a, a single layer of carbon atoms. For that, you can use optical microscopes or, uh, or more advanced technologies. And uh, that's, that's simple enough that when we had uh, visitors uh, uh, to our booth in, uh, in uh, uh, Warsaw uh, a couple of years ago, uh, politicians and, uh, and uh, visiting researchers made their own graphene within three minutes, and uh, we used uh, a microscope to show that, yes, they had uh, managed to do that. So that's the, uh, uh, the academic way of doing it. Uh, the, uh, I think we will hear more about uh, this method that is based on uh, silicon carbide. Uh, Mikhail Suvayarvi is uh, one of the next uh, speakers, so I'm sure he will uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, a chemical vapor deposition of uh, uh, graphene. Uh, that uh, is based on the fact that you have, uh, and that's something that uh, August Jurgens, for instance, does here at Chalmers. Uh, you have a, a copper foil uh, or copper film, and you introduce uh, carbon atoms on top of the copper foil or copper film. Typically, you get the carbon atoms from, say, acetylene or methane or something that you heat up to high temperature so that it disintegrates. The atoms will fall here and... Uh, and for reasons that are a little too complicated to uh, explain here, they form a, a, a graphene layer on the copper. And what is more miraculous is that uh, it, the process stops once one monolayer has been formed. And that's something that can be done in large scale. I got uh, a sample from uh, byung Hee Hong of uh, CVD-grown graphene, uh, where okay, the, uh, basically it goes through the entire process from these uh, uh, copper foils uh, to uh, graphene on copper foil, to uh, 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 polymer on graphene on copper foil, uh, then you wash away or etch away the copper foil, you, now you have graphene on a polymer, and then it turns out that that wasn't the polymer that you wanted, you uh, put a different polymer and you get graphene on PET. Uh, the difficulty here is that uh, this last picture, which is graphene on large sample, which is graphene on PET, I could equally well show you a cut up a PET bottle, you would not be able to tell the difference unless you go to the uh, lab and, uh, and measure it. And so uh, uh, that's a, a discussion that we always have with uh, journalists who want to take nice pictures. Uh, uh, but this shows that already uh, here I have, uh, you know, four or five uh, uh, sheets of graphene which are maybe uh, 30 by 40 centimeters uh, in size and one atomic layer thick. Uh, the, uh, as far as I know, the world record uh, in published literature is by Sony uh, that in January this year uh, uh, demonstrated roll-to-roll -roll production of graphene, 23 centimeters wide, 100 meters long, and one atomic layer thick. Uh, if you can do something that is uh, 23 centimeters uh, wide, you can do uh, something that is 7 meters wide. There is no scientific length scale in between. The, uh, the only obstacle is how much money do you have uh, that you want to uh, uh, upscale the, uh, the production. Uh, here, I should say that there was another uh, difficulty uh, that to make the 100 meters in their process, it took 24 hours. So the production was still rather slow. Uh, but eventually, it should be possible to make that uh, more or less uh, like paper in the same way. And roughly at the same cost, because uh, you can reuse the copper uh, in many ways. Uh, the only thing that uh, you need is, is carbon atoms, and those you can get from many places. I've heard uh, reports where people made graphene starting from Belgian chocolate. And personally, I think there are better uses for Belgian chocolate. Uh, but it doesn't much matter where, what your uh, carbon feedstock is. Uh, if you really want to make large quantities of graphene, uh, then you start from graphite, uh, either uh, uh, graphite that comes from mines somewhere or artificial graphite. Uh, you uh, uh, intercalate, uh, introduce some extra atoms between the, uh, the layers in graphite, could be uh, potassium, could be uh, some other suitable material, put it in a, a liquid and you apply ultrasound, you sonicate, the, uh, the layers come apart, they break apart, so you get small flakes uh, of, uh, of graphene. These small flakes are sufficient for some applications, I'll uh, mention a, uh, a little bit more about that in the next slide. This is by far the cheapest, the largest volume. Uh, uh, this 
these methods here are uh, smaller volumes and more expensive. Uh, this is uh, tiny volumes and really expensive. Uh, to uh, uh, put a little bit numbers on that, uh, the uh, exfoliated uh, uh, graphene, there, uh, uh, the, uh, the platelets that you get are typically of the order of a micron uh, in size, maybe a little less. Uh, there are many uh, uh, commercial suppliers. Uh, Avanzare is a Spanish uh, company. Uh, Forbeck Materials is an American company from Princeton. Uh, as of last week, the price from Avanzare was that if you buy 100 grams of nanoplatelets, it costs you 935 euros. Uh, if you buy more, the price goes down. Uh, I didn't check the fallback prices, but you know, uh, usually they can't differ too much uh, for the same quality. Uh, this kind of material is very well suited for composites. Uh, in uh, this uh, tennis racket, uh, that's made of graphene composites, and uh, uh, that composite material contains these kinds of nanoplates. In this case, uh, from a source in Taiwan. Uh, the uh, next, in terms of uh, uh, increasing quality, is this uh, chemical vapor deposition uh, and grown and graphene, uh, where uh, the size is meters or square meters, if you wish. Uh, again, uh, there are a number of commercial suppliers. Uh, Grafenea is a, uh, another Spanish company. Avanzare sells this as well. Bluestone is a Chinese company that is uh, in the process of building a, a factory in Manchester. Uh, the price is a bit higher. You can get a four-inch wafer, uh, silicon dioxide wafer, so 10 centimeters in diameter, uh, coated with a monolayer of graphene, costs uh, last week 675 uh, uh, euros, uh, I think, from Grafenea. Uh, this kind of a material you typically use for electronics and optics. It's higher quality, it's higher price, uh, and that's uh, a typical application area. The next in terms of a better quality, uh, is silicon carbide-based uh, graphene that I think we may hear uh, about in a, in a little while from Mikhail Sivayarli. There, the typical size is centimeters, uh, at least presently. Uh, and uh, companies, I don't know if you are selling commercially, but uh, at least, well, uh, Mikhail is nodding, so yes, uh, there is a commercial supplier. There probably are others. Uh, price, I dare not put anything because, you know, I could uh, make a commitment that I can't honor myself. Uh, this is also used for electronics. It's uh, such high quality that it can be used for uh, metrological applications, uh, which is what we do, do at, uh, at Chalmers, for instance. Still the highest quality is mechanical exfoliated graphene, uh, where the size of these flakes is, is uh, a few micrometers. Uh, the sources are make it yourself or you can buy it. You can buy it from a number of companies, such as Graphene Industry. The price uh, from Graphene Industry was about 5 euros per square micrometer. Uh, so you will not want to make huge things out of this. Uh, the basic use is research. I, uh, I'm highly doubtful that there, uh, there are any other uh, usage. But uh, uh, certainly uh, these uh, upper uh, rows indicate that we are... Uh, uh, approaching industrialization. Uh, the graphene was really the uh, first starting point for these layered materials. There are other layered materials that look like graphene, that are atomically thin. Uh, is modified uh, uh, graphene. There's a graphane. Uh, there is boron nitride, which is perhaps the uh, uh, next, uh, next uh, uh, most uh, studied material. There's tungsten disulfide uh, or uh, diselenide, uh, molybdenum, uh, or any, many other uh, metal uh, dichalcogenides uh, or modified graphene. Uh, many of these things can be uh, fabricated uh, by uh, exfoliation, mechanical exfoliation. More and more of them can be fabricated by chemical vapor deposition. They have different uses. Uh, they can be uh, put together uh, in uh, sandwiches uh, that uh, are needed for special applications. Nowadays, most of the sandwiches are made by uh, transfer. You make the materials first, and then you transfer them, which is painful uh, and uh, low yield. Uh, there is a lot of studies going on uh, making uh, them by CVD. Nowadays, one can, for instance, grow 
graphene on boron nitride. One can grow boron nitride on graphene. Uh, and that kind of activity is rapidly being developed. Uh, what makes graphene so special? Uh, well, uh, there are several reasons why graphene makes, uh, is, is special. One is that carbon is amazing. We had uh, just last uh, Friday uh, Professor Millie Dresselhaus uh, from MIT visit uh, Chalmers uh, uh, when she received the Lisa Meitner Prize. She's been working on carbon for uh, five or six decades and is still going strong. Uh, what is amazing about carbon is that this carbon-carbon bond is very, very strong. And that uh, you know. You know that diamond is a very hard material. That you can relate back to the very strong bond. Uh, and the uh, very strong bond means that graphene has excellent strength, uh, both in terms of when you try to break it apart, but also chemically. It really wants to stay graphene. Uh, it, not much uh, impurities, not much uh, uh, lattice defects or, uh, or things like that. A consequence of that is that if you, we take some uh, uh, graphene and put it in uh, composite materials like in these tennis rackets, relatively small uh, addition, in this case one uh, weight percent uh, of graphene has uh, increased uh, the, uh, the stiffness of, say, 1.5. That's easier for me to compare. 1.5 weight percent of graphene in this composite has increased the, th uh, the stiffness by a little more than a factor of two, uh, has also increased the, uh, the strength by uh, 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 more than a factor of two. So these relatively small amounts uh, of fillers uh, can have uh, rather substantial effects. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, mechanical properties of these materials. Uh, um, the mechanical properties really come back to this amazingly strong carbon-carbon uh, bond. Another reason that graphene is special is that in, in carbon, we, uh, you can have uh, many types of hybridization. Uh, in diamond, you have this sp3 hybridization that results in a three-dimensional structure. In graphene, you have sp2 hybridization, which is uh, something that you use every time you write with your pencil. You leave some carbon atoms on the piece of paper. That's why it turns black. And uh, because of the sp2 hybridization, the, uh, the layers uh, release themselves very easily. This uh, uh, sp2 hybridization leaves one extra electron. Uh, this fellow that is uh, marked in blue here uh, to form something called pi bonds. And those are not contributing very much to the uh, strength of the material, but these electrons can easily uh, travel uh, through your sample. And those electrons, when they move around, they uh, carry electricity and they carry uh, uh, heat. Uh, and that means, or that has as a result, uh, that uh, graphene is the best conductor of heat of any material that we know. It also implies that graphene is a very good conductor of electricity. Here there are some studies of, uh, uh, from Eric Pop's group in Illinois uh, about uh, uh, something called mobility, which tells about how quickly the electrons move uh, around. And the, uh, the highest figures here are for graphene that is suspended, that is without a substrate. It's uh, freely hanging in the air. Uh, that has a very high uh, mobility. If you put graphene on a substrate, uh, phonons in the substrate and impurities in the substrate slow down your electrons a bit. So then it gets uh, uh, less good, but uh, materials like silicon and germanium uh, that we typically use for electronics are far below uh, here. Uh, so that is a, uh, one of the reasons why graphene is so interesting for electronics applications. Another reason is that if you look at the, the way the holes move and the electrons move, there is basically no difference uh, there, very little difference. Uh, then, another reason why graphene is special is that if you look at the graphene lattice, it looks uh, uh, like this. Well, uh, all these red and blue uh, squares are carbon atoms. Uh, I have colored, or whoever made this picture has colored some blue and some red. Uh, the blue ones always have a, a neighboring atom on the right, whereas the red ones always have a neighboring atom on the left. And uh, because uh, the blue and the, uh, the red are the same kind of atoms, this has a certain kind of symmetry that implies uh, a very strange kind of electronic spectrum. It implies that uh, the, uh, the graphene is 
sort of between metals, metals being materials where you have a lot of electrons in the Fermi level that are free to move around, and insulators where you have an energy gap, so uh, the uh, conduction band and the valence band are separated. In graphene, they are near the, uh, neither overlapping nor separated. They touch in uh, only six points. And that is an immediate consequence of, of this uh, symmetry. And that uh, strange electronic structure uh, has a, a number of consequences. Firstly, uh, it means that if we uh, add a little charge carriers, uh, there are states for them to go, uh, and go to. Or if we remove some charge carriers, uh, there are some available uh, states for the carriers uh, to hop into. So we can get an electron and hole conduction. This is a uh, uh, picture of the conductivity uh, of uh, graphene as a function of gate voltage. If the gate voltage is uh, nil, uh, so that uh, the Fermi level is exactly at these uh, points where the conduction and valence bands touch, the conductivity is not very high, uh, but uh, still, uh, excuse me, this, this is uh, resistivity. So the conductivity, resistivity is not infinite, but it, it's relatively resistive. Uh, and once you either add electrons or add holes, uh, the, uh, the resistivity goes down. Uh, so uh, uh, graphene is something called an ambipolar material. Uh, it conducts electricity both by means of electrons and by means of holes which is a good news, but it's also bad news. It means that it's very difficult to make a graphene transistor turn completely off. Another consequence is that, that uh, of this linear spectra is that graphene can absorb light of any wavelength uh, because the, uh, there is no band gap, and so there is no uh, threshold energy for absorbing light. And since the spectrum is linear, uh, the absorption is the same regardless of wavelength. And it turns out to be 2.3%, uh, or if you uh, like natural constant, it's pi times e squared divided by h bar divided by c, and if you use SI units, you need to divide by 4 pi epsilon naught. And it's pi times the fine structure constant, which turns out to be this 2.3%. Uh, so every layer of graphene absorbs 2.3% of light, which is actually a huge amount, considering that it's only one atomic layer thick. Uh, but that's also the, uh, the way how you can uh, recognize graphene in, uh, in an uh, optical microscope. So this uh, is the reason why it's so, such an attractive material for uh, optoelectronics, for instance, or uh, solar cells. You can absorb uh, even the long wavelength light uh, and turn it into electricity. The last point is that graphene is impermeable uh, to very small things, even helium atoms. This is the world's smallest balloon. Uh, I think the, uh, the bar here, or the, this uh, is about uh, uh, half a micron. And uh, this is graphene membrane put on silicon uh, dioxide, and one adds uh, 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 helium atoms uh, underneath. And the helium does not leak through. It just acts as a pressure on the graphene membrane. Uh, so despite the fact that uh, we have been drawing these chicken wires, uh, hexagonal patterns with small carbon atoms in the corner. Uh, reality is not like that. There is really no void in the middle. Uh, even small things such as helium atoms can't go through. Graphene is impermeable. Uh, that uh, you can take advantage of in applications. The latest application that I heard is that if you want to study biological samples in microscope, you can encapsulate uh, then uh, uh, between two graphene sheets. You can have a liquid uh, between two graphene sheets and you can uh, uh, study the properties of the liquid using microscope because the two sheets don't really uh, 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 add uh, much obstacle. And plus, you know that they absorb exactly 2.3% of no matter what light you put in. So this is something that people in the biomedical community are getting excited about because now they can use microscopes to study these uh, liquid samples in, in a way that has not been possible before. Another uh, uh, point is that if a uh, perfect graphene membrane is impermeable, you can make holes in it and make it permeable. Uh, if you, depending on what size holes you make, uh, you can control what size objects go through. And uh, there is a, an, an interesting application that originally comes from MIT but is being commercialized by Lockheed Martin to use uh, graphene for a desalination of, uh, of seawater. Uh, you make uh, 
you have seawater on one side, uh, and you make a hole in a graphene membrane uh, here. Uh, the, uh, the salts, uh, which are big because of the, uh, uh, the fact that they attract uh, all kinds of ions uh, around them due to uh, uh, their charge, can't get through, whereas the, uh, the uh, smaller objects get through. And that way you can desalinate uh, salt water. The advantage, opposed, as opposed to other semi-permeable membranes, is that since graphene is so thin, you don't need much pressure difference to pu uh, push the stuff through. And that means that you can uh, uh, save a lot of money. Uh, the uh, uh, semi-permeable membrane technology has existed for a long time. For instance, if you go to uh, Santa Barbara in the U.S., they have a, a desalination plant which was built in the 1980s and has not been used since because it's too expensive to run. Uh, but uh, with uh, this technology, uh, the cost should go down. Sometimes people ask about uh, graphene uh, versus nanotubes, because nanotubes are uh, the closest relative. Uh, they have a number of uh, common features. They are both very good conductors of heat and electricity. They are both very strong and flexible. Uh, carbon nanotubes have some advantages. Uh, they have uh, electrical band gap, something that uh, electrical engineers like. Uh, they have been around for a longer time, uh, so they are produced in larger quantities. Uh, they also have more known health issues because of the geometrical uh, structure of the nanotubes and the fact that oftentimes the, uh, the catalyst particles uh, stick to the nanotubes. Graphene has better reproducibility. There is only one kind of a graphene, whereas for carbon nanotubes you have the issue of chirality. Some are metallic, some are semiconducting. Uh, a great advantage for graphene for uh, 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 engineers is that they are very compatible with uh, planar technology, and planar technology has been developed for uh, 50, 60 years in, in semiconductor industry. So graphene is very good for that. Also, the larger area uh, offers some advantages, in particular when it comes to optics and sensors. So uh, uh, if you look at the uh, evolution of the two fields, uh, here is academic uh, publications. You see that uh, carbon nanotube publications are still growing. Graphene publications are uh, uh, growing a bit faster, but there are still more carbon nanotube publications. I made this study in uh, early days of June this year, so this year's figures are, are only for like five months, but if we do an extrapolation, so certainly by 2014, graphene publications exceed carbon nanotube publications. If you look at the, uh, the patent landscape, uh, uh, European Patent Office search, you see that already last year, more uh, graphene patents were filed than carbon nanotube patents. This year, at the time that I did this analysis, uh, it was about a factor of two between graphene patent applications and carbon nanotube publications. So it appears that these engineering advantages uh, are significant enough uh, that uh, the commercialization seems to go faster. So a uh, couple of examples of uh, uh, these system-level uses. Where might you find... And graphene later on. Uh, some examples are information technology, uh, where you use the fact that uh, it's flexible, it combines optical and electrical functionalities. Uh, those can be uh, uh, taken advantage of in uh, more versatile and more powerful information processing and communication devices, such as this uh, idea that was first presented by uh, Nokia, and I think uh, now Samsung has roughly the same kind of a video in, uh, in Korean. The other example is uh, from transport industry. This car, Smart for Vision, was presented by uh, Daimler and BASF in uh, the uh, uh, Automesse in Frankfurt some time ago. It's not a graphene project, uh, but uh, it nevertheless uh, is a good example. Uh, it's an uh, electric car, so it needs advanced batteries. Uh, that's an uh, entry point for graphene. Uh, you need to be able to drive the car for long distances at low fuel consumption, so you need to keep the weight down, so uh, strong, lightweight composite materials are of interest. Uh, they have decided to integrate solar cells in the roof. That's yet another entry point uh, for graphene in solar cell technology. Uh, it turns out that this car, while it was uh, or is not a graphene project, already contains graphene, uh, and graphene composites in a very strange place, namely the seeds. For some reason, uh, they concluded uh, that graphene composites were an, uh, a very good material for seed heaters. 
Another area in our climate that you might be interested in is this graphene is transparent uh, and uh, it has uh, uh, finite electrical resistivity. You could uh, integrate it in the uh, uh, windshield, for instance, uh, to make a, a windshield heater for winter use uh, that you can uh, see through. So that, uh, uh, that's a couple of examples. So that was uh, sort of the, uh, the uh, science part. Now a few words about the, the flagship. As mentioned earlier, it's 10 years uh, and uh, 1,000 million euros. Uh, now there are 75 partners because uh, one group moved from uh, University College London to, uh, to Manchester. Uh, those 75 partners come from uh, 17 countries. Uh, we have 11 uh, scientific and technical work packages on graphene and related layered materials. Uh, the graphene flagship is led by Chalmers, but you should uh, realize that Chalmers is about 2.5% of the flagship, and the flagship is about 20% of Chalmers. Uh, so uh, you should not put an equality sign uh, between those two. And it starts uh, in uh, a short while, on October 1st. The work packages uh, are listed here. We have a, 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 in order of increasing maturity. We have some work packages on environmental and health aspects, fundamental science. The middle layer is more mostly component technologies, and the top layer is uh, mostly systems uh, integrations. Uh, you will find more industrial partners leading the uh, work packages on the top and uh, fewer industrial partners involved at the bottom, uh, as is, uh, is natural. When time passes, some of the technologies from here will, uh, will move up there, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, some uh, new uh, ideas will uh, come from the bottom. Uh, I have uh, made, for the first time ever, uh, an estimate uh, of the... Uh, maturity of these different technologies. Uh, the, uh, the ones that are most mature are uh, composites. You can already go to a tennis shop near here and buy the racket. So it's uh, clearly uh, out in the market. Uh, production, uh, at least chemical exfoliation, uh, is uh, in uh, full speed. Otherwise, you could not make your tennis racket and sell it. Uh, CVD production, there are reasons to believe that it has already reached very high technology readiness levels, but uh, within uh, uh, companies that are not really uh, uh, putting it out on the market. Uh, energy applications, I think the most maturing one is a supercapacitor. Uh, it's a little bit of a guess uh, where you exactly put it here. Flexible electronics, uh, we have confidential information that... Uh, uh, indicates that at least uh, system-level prototypes have been reached. Uh, uh, on the y-axis, uh, 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 technology readiness level. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, the domain of academics. Uh, this is something that you can go and buy. And uh, there are different definitions, uh, exactly what are needed for different levels. Uh, this comes with a question mark because I have been shown a picture of a product using graphene in smart packaging, but I have not seen the product. Uh, so I, I, I do not know if it exists. Uh, here we know for sure uh, that there are field tests of graphene-based touchscreens uh, where the, uh, the uh, industrial driver is, uh, is uh, to find a replacement for indium tin oxide. Uh, and uh, this, I'm sure, is, is something uh, where one can uh, 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 criticize some uh, assignments and come up with better assignments. And some of the things are under the surface. We don't quite know what's available. Uh, when it comes to the flagship budget, the total research cost during the first 30 months is about 75 million euros, of which the commission gives us uh, 54 million euros. It's divided... Uh, among these uh, different work packages in a slightly different way. Uh, what catches your eye is that production work package seems to be getting a very tiny slice, considering the importance of that technology. That's a mirage, because the Commission funds this slice uh, through another program called NMP, uh, where they are funding two very large projects uh, with a total project cost of about 20 uh, million euros. So if you uh, were to uh, include uh, that 
funding that comes outside our instrument, uh, then uh, this would correspond to like 30-40% uh, of the circle. Uh, our funding is, is relatively small in, in that area. Uh, consortium expansion. In the first expansion stage uh, takes place in November. Uh, we have reserved 9 million euros. Uh, there will be a focus on engineering. There will be one uh, topic per work package. Uh, those topics will be decided on October 11 uh, by the executive board of the, uh, uh, of the flagship, and they will be published in, in November. Uh, we can't pick and choose, but the selection of new partners will be done by external independent experts using the criteria of scientific and technological excellence, impact, and implementation. There is an information booklet available. I didn't remember to bring any with me now, but I can bring them uh, by uh, lunchtime for sure. The uh, other uh, expansion is uh, through national efforts uh, from Sweden. Wetenskapsrådet uh, and Vinova are participating in a project called Flag Era, uh, which uh, has the purpose of supporting the flagships, and there will be a multinational call probably in 2014. We don't know the, uh, the focus and we don't know the volume. Uh, then uh, once we move to Horizon 2020, uh, the flagship uh, budget will uh, roughly double, uh, which in implies that we can bring in new partners, we can extend the flagship to uh, new technology areas, things that have been uh, mentioned, uh, medical technologies, coatings, maybe digital electronics, if things are uh, uh, maturing fast enough to justify the uh, large-scale investment in those. Uh, if uh, uh, flagship is only 20% of Chalmers uh, graphene research, where does the other 80% come from? It comes from national funding agencies, uh, such as Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, Foundation for Strategic Research. It comes from Chalmers internal funding all of those things uh, are collected under something called Chalmers, uh, Chalmers Graphene Center, uh, which has a, a web page that will go online tomorrow. Uh, so if you go to www.chalmers.sc slash graphene, and apparently you can spell graphene either in English or in Swedish, uh, you should end up here. Uh, it's uh, going alive tomorrow, according to the latest information that I got this morning. Uh, so I have not been able to, uh, to test that. But you can test it yourselves. I think uh, that uh, brings me to the uh, uh, final slide. Uh, uh, motto, if you wish, graphene disruptive technologies from academic laboratories into uh, society. And I will uh, finish there. Thank you.